All right. Thanks a lot, Stephen, for inviting me here, and uh, welcome, everyone. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to to talk a little bit about what uh, we have been doing in the past uh, few years uh, with what we call the DGTD method. This is called discontinuous Galerkin time domain. And I will try to explain to you what that means uh, in just about the next few minutes. Um, before I do that, actually, um, let me first thank uh, my co-workers. These are in presently the members of my group and those in blue are uh, the people that are working on the project or have worked. I mean, the, the little star here says that they have graduated and have now moved on uh, over the last year or so. And uh, we also have, of course, the good fortune to have a, a set of very nice collaborators ranging from applied math, that would be Marlies Hochburg and Stefan Lanteri, uh, all the way to physics and experiments. Um, and um, of course, we do have some funding, as you can see here as well. And um, having said that, um, uh, uh, let me start out with a little bit of a repetition, almost uh, that, that uh, Stephen has already uh, introduced a little bit on, on the FTTD side. And my perspective is that more of a modeling person, not so much of a design and optimization person. So I uh, work a lot with the experimentalists and they come with all these nasty questions. Uh, of quantities to calculate uh, in very strange geometries with strange length scales and um, very strange structures with a lot of aspects, uh, different aspect ratios, uh, different lengths and time scales. So, and then of course you, you look into the problem and the MEEP is of course the, the premier uh, method for solving the method, uh, Maxwell equations in the time domain. And uh, Stephen has already introduced all uh, the niceties and also the problems a little bit of FDTD and um, uh, what I have been wondering about or my group has been wondering about whether or not we can somehow also get the advantages of finite elements um, uh, to the game here um, and uh, of course in finite elements that normally uh, work in the frequency domain and normally solve the wave equation rather than the Maxwell equation we have also a, a, a list of plus and cons because obviously there is not the solver for Maxwell equations uh, that also Stephen has pointed out before and so the question is can we put somehow uh, that the story together in the sense that we want to have a method that has a lot of the niceties of the different approaches um, uh, but maybe can then bypass some of the disadvantages and uh, that, that you can see here. So we want to have a method that can do all of those highlighted elements. And uh, I, I'm trying to convince you that what is now this DGTD, this discontinuous galactic time domain method is at least a way that we can proceed with a certain class of problems. Uh, certainly, again, we cannot solve all problems, or, uh, but we, we have some advantages and some uh, uh, geometry aspects or in some uh, multi-length, multi-scale type problems. And uh, so this is the outline then. Uh, I first want to give you a little bit of a glimpse into how the method works. Um, and then I want to show you some of the examples that we have been working on lately. Um, and uh, they, they range from uh, anisotropic materials via lasing uh, to, to electron optics, if you like, and then also plasmonics. Um, and so let's first start with the, the method itself, how it looks like. And of course, now you have to be a little bit careful with this. Um, uh, this is now going to be the, the applied math part of the talk, if you like. Um, and uh, uh, the way where, where the method starts is the, or from where it starts is, is here, is shown here. Uh, sorry, let me go back. Um, oh, that was too fast. Um, so this is actually, these are Maxwell's curl equation written in a very, very funny form. Um, uh, you see here the time derivatives uh, and you have a six component vector here that consists of two free vectors. And then you see here the divergence of what is called the flux. And this flux is a real strange creature. It is again, a free component vector. The I runs from one to three. Uh, uh, and then you have six component vectors as the entries of that free component vector. And what you have here is the unit vector in uh, direction x, y, z. So i runs from x, y, z. And you have these strange um, cross products here, or this curl, uh, yeah, cross products. And then uh, if you work that out, it actually is just a way of rewriting um, the curl equations of Maxwell in, in a form which looks like a conservation law. Yeah, So you have the divergence of a flux here. And uh, you can 
directly put in any non-dispersive uh, non material, uh, spatially dependent uh, in form of this Q matrix here. Uh, you will see in a second why I need that or why I, I would like to use such type of formulations. Now, um, having said that we want to do finite elements now, of course, we, we go exactly and do that. Um, we, we tessellate domain into triangles, tetrahedra. Um, then we look for a, uh, on, on each of these elements, we look now for a nice set of basis function uh, where we can expand the field. Um, we actually take the Lagrange polynomials uh, that are uh, one on uh, one interpolation point and zero on all other interpolation points. And here you see one uh, uh, element of flexibility that we have, we can adjust the order of the basis functions here pretty nicely by just taking higher order Lagrange polynomials. You know? um, and of course, then these amplitudes here, they directly give the field values on the uh, uh, on these interpolation points that we have chosen to set up a Lagrange basis. Yeah? So we get directly the fields on a, a number of points that we choose. Of course, now we have to declare how we want to solve Maxwell's equation. We insert this into Maxwell equations, and then we get, first of all, a residual. And now we have to say how we want to solve these equations. And uh, doing a finite element method, you can imagine how we want to do this. Uh, first of all, here you see um, a way of doing these interpolation points, how that looks in practice. Um, you see, we can use uh, what Tim Warburton has written up here, uh, an algorithm that uh, develops a uh, uh, polynomial, a set of polynomials of specified order in 2D or in 3D, and we can go very high up in the spatial order of discretization. Of course, then we need also more points. Um, and uh, then, uh, as I have said, we want to solve the problem. Um, and uh, the way how you do this is like you go with finite element methods anyways. You say, I project the error, which we have here in the bracket, uh, onto the expansion functions. So this would be called in mathematics the Galakin choice, um, and say that in this space the error should be zero. I integrate here over the elements, um, and now this gives me a set of equations. But of course, it gives a set of equations for each element separately. And now uh, I have to somehow tie all these elements together into one solution. Um, uh, and uh, that the way how this is done is by exploiting here the fact that we have a divergence. So you can loosely imagine that if you do a integration here, so you use Gauss law, essentially, uh, you will get a surface term when you apply uh, Gauss law to this term here, you get a surface term that, uh, uh, that connects or is able to connect to the neighboring elements. And from the neighboring elements, if you do the same thing there as well, uh, you get also a surface term. And then you can declare on the surface how you want to couple the elements together. Um, and uh, this is done by what is called a penalty term here um, and eventually leads to a, a here you can do approximation and then you can uh, get what is called a numerical flux that is also known from finite volume methods, for example. And so at the end of the day, uh, you get such type of scheme here where you have your... Um, usual stuff that comes from the finite element um, technology. So you get the mass matrix and the stiffness matrix and all of this coming out from here. And then you get a uh, here another set of matrices where the separate elements are coupled uh, together. Um, and of course, that means that you can nicely parallelize this as well, uh, because you have element-wise, basically, um, uh, matrices here only for one element. And then you have coupling only to the next neighboring elements here. Um, and uh, basically, in, in effectively, you can now invert this part here. And this gives you uh, basically an, an uh, explicit time stepping scheme. And this is the big advantage of that approach relative to ordinary finite elements. Uh, when you solve the wave equation, there you are not able to formulate an explicit time stepping scheme easily, so you would get an implicit one. And you know, of course, if you have 10 to the 6 unknowns and you need to solve a system of equation at every time step, this is really expensive, uh, which this scheme is not. Yeah? Um, and uh, there is one added feature that I want to highlight here, uh, because I still haven't told you about the discontinuous part in the talk or in the title of, of uh, the method. Uh, and the name of the method, and th this is the one that you can see here. Uh, if you look very carefully to our interpolation points, um, we actually have uh, on the face of each element, we have interpolation points that are now uh, coming together here. 
uh, and meet eventually when, when they are going um, into the finite element scheme. So what we can now do here on this uh, uh, interface between two neighboring elements, we can either have uh, uh, continuous functions, so the continuous field components can be easily represented by just identifying the unknowns, but we can also model jumps very e efficiently. Yeah? So discontinuities where the function is not differentiable. Um, and that means uh, th these are also very nicely modeled in such an approach. And that's why the method is called the discontinuous Galakin time domain method. And I should say, of course, uh, we have not invented this. Um, the method is actually uh, in the way how I present that has been uh, developed by Jan Hesthaven and Tim Warburton. And you see they have written a book, uh, the paper that basically the first paper on this is back from 2002. Uh, so it's a fairly new method um, uh, that works very nicely. Um, and of course, um, Jan Hesthaven and Tim Warburton being sort of applied mathematicians, I hope they are not in the audience uh, or uh, nobody will take offense here, but of course this is the basic method uh, that you have and now you want to do real computations and then of course you need a lot of niceties um, and then add-ons to be included uh, that of course are all in heap already contained and now you have to go uh, and this is what we have done over the past years, I mean to step by step uh, add all those niceties, I have written up, up some of them um, um, for you and what we have already implemented here. I mean, of course, and this is an endless list uh, that uh, can go on forever. Uh, like also Stephen has uh, talked, I mean, when you talk, uh, mentioned uh, material uh, models and all of this, you, you just, you will never stop. We have written, also written a little bit regular, which is a bit old now, um, but if you're, if you're interested, look it up. And then we can also look at the papers that cite this one um, or look at our webpage and then you can find a number of technical references on this. So, for example, how do we add complicated materials, dispersive materials, or whatever? Uh, this is the same as in me. Basically, we add a um, auxiliary differential equation, so we add a current or a polarization term, uh, and we develop a uh, auxiliary differential equation for that thing here. Um, and I will show you one example just now. Uh, for example, in plasmonics, where we have those strange time scales, especially at the surface, we have the evanescent fields that decay very fast. Uh, but the plasmonic structures may be very long, and, and then there may be even nano gaps. Um, so there we have uh, a dis also a dispersive material uh, on top of this in, in, in the uh, sort of simplest version. And we do, of course, as usual, a continuum approximation. We don't look at individual electrons, but we consider a velocity field of the electrons and uh, a density, basically, of the electrons. And then the standard model that you know all is the Bruder model, or you can also add Bruder Lorentz terms. But of course, you can also become a little bit more um, demanding on this, uh, especially if you consider carefully near field effects or nano gap structures, then you actually need to model also a, a time and space dependent charge density of the electrons, because basically what you have here is a um, uh, is an electron liquid slushing in a box, um, uh, and you excite that from the outside um, with some optical fields, for example. Yeah? So I will come back to that point later. But now just um, uh, as a little in, uh, sort of, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, as a first example, um, uh, let us talk about these things here. This is our uh, poor man's attempt of doing something in terms of design optimization now. Um, this is nowhere near the methods that we have just heard in the talk before. Um, but nonetheless, it's quite interesting. Uh, so, um, uh, for example, we were concerned with now uh, a, a structure where you have a meta surface, and the meta surface consists of uh, cerium doped uh, bismuth iron garnet material. Um, uh, and the these scatterers here that are now in this case a disc, it is a, it's a disc, they are designed in such a way that they have simultaneously. Uh, dipole magnetic and electric dipole resonances overlapping in frequency. Um, so, so basically this is called the Kirker condition. Um, and that means that you have almost near 100% transmission through the structure. If now um, that material and, and uh, cerium doped bismuth iron garnet is such a material, uh, is Faraday active, um, you can actually get a very nice Faraday rotation uh, through that structure with 100% transmission. Um, and of course, you want now to uh, make uh, an optimization in terms of the rotation of polarization when you go through that structure. 
Yeah? And uh, so our poor man's approach was to say, well, let's start out from a disc and then model the surface, um, as you have seen also before a little bit with a spline. And let's uh, put those uh, the few points there on the surface and uh, uh, let those points, this spline interpolation points, be able to slide outside or inside in sort of a radial fashion up to a maximum distance so that we have a little design constraint here um, uh, implemented. And then um, we try to optimize this shape here um, to get maximum rotation. And uh, of course, we have to have a figure of merit. Uh, you can see the figure of merit here. Uh, that is the transmission times the uh, uh, polarization rotation that happens when I go through that structure. Um, and you can see um, when, when you do this, um, uh, you find, first of all, that you have a, a this transmittance as a function of frequency, for example, in, in this range here that we are interested in. You find here that, that you have uh, so this, this Kirker condition satisfied with 100% transmission and have certain frequency. And then you get also the Faraday rotation out of this, um, uh, uh, including the ellipticity. And so you find the figure of merit is extremely high. Uh, and that this is the shape optimized structure. Um, uh, and uh, that is the best uh, disk that we could find. And you can see here that we got a, a basically a 50% increase by having that strange star-like shape that you could see here, um, which is still manufacturable. So we, we, we took care that we can here have, uh, that we have these, these curvatures here are uh, still okay for the experiment. And uh, we hope that uh, now our friends are going to produce these type of structures. Um, and uh, you see this is on a, the, the thickness of the of the material is 260 nanometers. Um, sorry, I should go back. Uh, 260 nanometers, and uh, on this 260 nanometers, you get 100% transmission and 15 degree rotation of the polarization. Now, um, and uh, what happens is relatively clear when you look. It, and eventually, you want to understand the physics. You look at the field distribution, uh, and then you can see that um, the uh, this, this, this shape design that, that we have now this, uh, is sampling or make, making the dipole resonance, for example, here sample the magnetic material much better than the disk does. So that's why you get, of course, the uh, larger um, rotation out of this. Yeah, so this is, of course, very simple optimization, not nowhere near what, what, what we have just heard before. And now let's move on to a, a, a other structure that is, uh, has been a concern of us. I mean, also from the experimental motivation here, uh, our friends in Dresden University, they uh, was, were setting up a, a, a DBR cavity, basically, um, where they put in a, a organic gain material, which is modeled as a four level system. Here and then they ask the question: uh, Look, what happens if we put in a grating inside this cavity here, so that we also get distributed feedback in this type, in this layer here? So can we then increase or decrease um, the lasing threshold for this cavity? Because when we increase, when we put in silver here, of course we add losses. That is bad, but we add the distributed feedback mechanism, which could potentially be very good and maybe lower. The lasing threshold. Yeah, and so we had to implement all of this, including um, a uh, localized pumping uh, through a Gaussian beam. Yeah, so you can see here also that we, we have now, I'm sorry, this is again jumping back, so that we have uh, Gaussian beams implemented into the structure. And these Gaussian beams really do make a difference. Uh, when you have here a grating inside, as, as I have tried to, to, to tell you here, because what you can do is you can have the maximum of the beam going right through the middle of the grating here, um, so that there is no metal, or it could go right through the metal here, uh, which is uh, makes really a difference um, in terms of the lasing threshold. And actually, what you can also do is you can also now try to do what uh, the photonic crystal people would call band gap engineering of this band structure that you get from the DFB uh, lasing system uh, by taking out, for example, one of those uh, silver spheres and produce a defect, uh, not silver spheres, silver stripes, uh, and produce a defect. Um, and then you have maybe even a even lower uh, lasing threshold. And uh, um, to make a long story short, this is, you can see here the, the outcome of some of our calculations. Um, especially for the defect uh, system, this is a very interesting 
system. Um, and uh, then you, you see that um, you have a competition, of course, of the loss, as I mentioned before, and the gain. And uh, of course, I cannot explain all the details here. Yeah, you have to do a lot of calculations for the systems. Um, and at the end of the day, you calculate the um, lasing threshold for the different systems. And you see here, the color code is always the same. The red is always silver um, uh, without the silver. At all. So, so complete just a pure DDR cavity. Then you have the black stuff that is stripes without defect. Um, so it's a perfect DFD laser. And then the blue one is um, uh, the stripes with the defect. So this is the defect engineered um, thing. And these are the experimental findings on this side here. You can see that uh, when you just have the DFD stuff, although it's properly designed, uh, it is having a higher um, uh, lasing threshold. But when you actually do the defect engineering properly here, you see that then the lasing threshold, for example, or if you look at it here, um, the lasing threshold is lower than the pure DDR um, system. Yeah, And uh, from the theory point, um, from the modeling, uh, we of course have to first adjust the DDR to have that it has the same Q factor as the experimental. Uh, system, uh, and then we can play around with this, uh, whether it's helpful or not to increase the Q relative uh, to the loss. And uh, lo and behold, we can find actually situations which then correspond to the experimental situations also, um, where we have a lower um, uh, lasing threshold for the defect engineered system. Yeah, So this is um, uh, very interesting, and uh, it shows you I mean, all these multi-scale type capabilities. And then much of our time actually over the last years has been spent more with plasmonic elements um, uh, because this is where our method really is extremely fruitful. Um, and uh, some of our friends on the experimental side, they do like to do a lot of this electron energy loss spectroscopy where they actually send in a beam of electrons, which we model as a point electron flying through this tube here. Uh, that is our finite element mesh, as you can see here. And uh, we use this as a, actually this, uh, the inside that the electron flies in the middle of the inside of the tube here. And then we use this setup here as a, a sort of total field, scattered field framework where the electron flies uh, in the middle, in the total field region, and then it injects via uh, this uh, thing, um, uh, it, it, sorry, it's a, it's a scattered field region, of course, and uh, uh, it ejects then the uh, the energy or the, the, the fields inside the plasmonic area here. And then, for example, you have here a nanoparticle, which could be gold or something. Um, and then uh, what these electrons do, they, of course, they fly by. Um, they do then excite plasmons in this system, and then that means that they lose energy. And basically, if you then use what uh, in a laser person would call the undepleted pump approximation, so that you consider the fact that the electrons are super fast there. Yeah, these electrons have 100 keV or so uh, energy. They are almost they are relativistic, um, and they lose only a few electron volts of energy. Uh, so basically, their velocity does not change or change extremely. Uh, uh, to, uh, changes very little, I should say. Uh, then you basically just can calculate here. Um, the work done by the induced field uh, on the electron trajectory here. Uh, to, uh, you can calculate this work, and this is then the uh, loss that the electron experiences. Um, and then, of course, we talk here quantum mechanics uh, in, in the mean field sense. Then the, the people want to calculate this loss probability here. Uh, and the loss probability is then given as a Fourier transform of all this work done here. Yeah? So this is. Um, basically, uh, the, they call it a no recoil approximation. I mean, a laser physics person would call it the undepleted pump approximation, uh, which is the same story. And now you can raster scan, for example, a plasmonic material um, by shooting the beam through that structure, sort of perpendicular now to the plane where I'm now moving my cursor in. And then you record for each position of the electron beam, you record a spectrum, and then you take um, uh, the uh, peak of the spectrum, for example, at that resonance frequency that you see. And then depending on your position of the beam, the coupling changes, the strength of the coupling to this plasmonic mode of that structure changes. And then 
Uh, that means basically by raster scanning now the beam, the electron beam through here, you can actually map out the plasmonic modes uh, point by point for the different resonance frequencies. And you can even look at, uh, play these games here. Um, uh, you have, a, let's say, one resonance, and then you put two of the same next to each other. Uh, and then, of course, you will find an anti-binding mode, quote unquote, anti-binding or a binding mode here. Um, uh, and uh, this is the experimental picture on the top row here. And then in the, in the middle row, you see the our simulation results. And they look very nice. Um, uh, and they agree really uh, to a very large degree here. And they, they help a lot in terms of interpreting all this data. For example, when you go to even larger systems, yeah, and you have to do here a whole lot of computations, um, the experiment only finds three resonances for four coupled rings here for the fundamental frequency, the originally fundamental frequency at 6.65 EV, right? Um, uh, and they were really puzzled, why is that the case? But uh, then uh, you look more carefully from the theory point of view and you see that you have here two resonances, which are extremely close in energy and they are, uh, they cannot be resolved uh, by the electron microscope. Uh, so the electron microscope actually actually sees the superposition of these two pictures. And that explains the problem um, why they have sort of one missing element here. And clearly, of course, we can also calculate many other things um, like um, uh, field cut, uh, distributions and so on, which of course the electron, can, uh, electron microscope cannot see. Now, um, uh, just to show you one more example here, uh, this is a, a very interesting system that some of our experimental friends again asked us to do calculations for because here you have a gold tip that has a 20 nanometer curvature radius up in the tip here but it's overall it's i think 15 microns long and the idea is in the end of the day i mean to excite here optically plasmons that would propagate forward and then they would to lead very large field enhancement that could potentially uh, eject electrons and you make a little electron source here that's the idea. And now the question is, um, uh, will, when I excite, let's say, for example, also in an electron microscope, if I excite plasmons here by sending an electron beam through, will they really lead to plasmons that propagate all the way to the tip? And what is the field enhancement and so on uh, on these tips? Um, and that's uh, what we have done here. You can see really this is the movie. The electron comes in. It does excite those plasmons. You see a wave packet propagating to the left and to the right. Um, uh, and that's why you have now two wave packets because one of them has been reflected at the tip, but of course also at the tip there was some radiation being emitted. And you could also see the operation of the perfectly matched layers that surround uh, the element. Yeah, this is, this is a full 3D calculation. Um, and you basically see here the intensity of the electric field evolving um, and which basically then is a measure also, of course, uh, of the electron, uh, of the plasmonic wave packets here. Yeah? Uh, and this movie, by the way, you can download if you like from that reference here. This is uh, publicly available. Um, and uh, uh, of course, then you can make more detailed analysis. I don't want to go too much into this because uh, probably I'm running out of time. Um, and I want just to go on to this um, uh, last topic here. Um, uh, that I also mentioned in, in, in the beginning, um, when you do have now um, uh, such a, um, a small sizes, small curvature radius, or even nano gaps type structures, then usually the Druder or Druder Lawrence model is not a good idea because you do develop their non local characteristics, spatially non local characteristics for the um, electrons. And that, that means that. Uh, Contrary to what you assume in the Druda model, the, the electron density per se is not anymore spatially constant. It does depend on time, uh, and it moves against the fixed ionic background of the, you know, uh, of the remaining ionic lattice uh, of the of the metal. Um, and uh, so, what you have now to do is you have to develop a model for this, and one of these models um, is uh, basically considering. Um, the, the electrons as a charged fluid um, that have a conservation law. And remember, we can do conservation laws very well with our method here. Um, and actually, uh, you need then, of course, for two unknowns, current and charge density, you also need a second equation, obviously, and that is the 
uh, momentum conservation, yet another conservation law, which is very nice. Uh, but uh, of course, this now looks um, uh, in the usual hydrodynamic form. You have this uh, convective derivative here, and here you have the Lorentz force that drives the electrons. But of course, these electrons, they represent a, a Fermi uh, gas, basically, um, that is compressible. So you also have a pressure term here. Um, and the pressure term is, of course, one that is not very nice. Uh, this is a Fermi pressure term. It has a very strange dependence on power. And so this is a fully nonlinear um, problem, uh, especially considering that you couple also back to the Maxwell equation. So you have your bilinear coupling terms, which then means you get second harmonic, third harmonic generation, wave mixing, all sorts of stuff. Um, and that's what we have been doing. Uh, I mean, fully up in issue and also in a perturbative sense. Um, and of course, not only we, but um, numerically, um, we have done, I mean, the model itself. And you can see here, for example, a, a gold dimer here, uh, the spectra simply for different excitation values for the fields. And you see um, the fundamental frequency scales linearly with the uh, amplitude of the field. Um, the second harmonic peak scales quadratically, the third harmonic peak scales cubically. Uh, as it should. I mean, this is all in terms of validating um, the system. Yeah, you can now change, for example, the radius and keep the gap size the same and vice versa. You can run a lot of parameters um, and, and, and study all of this. And for example, look at what happens for application relevant systems. That would be, for instance, a nano gap structure here. And you would then want to calculate the actual field enhancement. And believe me, it is very much different in this non-local model um, than in the original or in, in, a, in a normal Druder model. For example, you see shifted resonances and you see in, in, in surface enhanced Raman scattering, for example, you calculate what is called the surface factor. This is the fourth power of the field enhancement. And you see here, this is quite different um, uh, for different for different models, yeah. For the Druder model, this is the local model. Um, you completely overestimate this surface factor here, so you have to be very careful um, with that. Um, and you actually should even go one step further because the, this hydrodynamic model does not include what is called Landau damping. Um, uh, and uh, uh, we have recently been able to add that. Um, to the game here, uh, and this is the frequency domain version, which we so obviously convert uh, via ADE in an, in an auxiliary differential equation as a, in a, uh, that we solve simultaneously. I mean, that, uh, there's a lot of theory behind it, but I don't want to go into that. But rather, I want to show you the first results that we have. And now just compare the two models. Um, here, the, here you see on the left, you see a Druder model. On the top row, where you have two uh, little uh, a dimer, basically, with a two nanometer gap, and then you have a 10 nanometer gap, and you get an excitation from the left yeah, um, that is polarized uh, along this direction here. So sorry that this is so slow here. Um, and then you calculate, for example, the field component in the longitudinal direction. And you see how the this thing behaves in the Druder model uh, and how it behaves in the two different models that I have just shown you, the uh, original hydrodynamical model um, and then the one where we have included Landau damping. You would say that is not very much different, uh, these two from the Druder model, but of course there's a lot of difference to the Druder model, yeah. So you see, this is very important. Um, but if you go a little bit further, uh, and calculate uh, the surface absorption uh, characteristics, you see that the two models are quite different uh, in their behavior. Uh, and this is, for example, the, the uh, what, what includes the Landau damping. This is just a difference to the hydrodynamic model that you can see here. Uh, it has here a lot of uh, additional surface damping involved um, when you include Landau damping into the system. And so this also gives you completely different uh, predictions um, for those plasmonic nanostructures, which of course now have to be tested experimentally. Yeah. Um, uh, and of course, obviously here we benefit from very high um, 
uh, orders of the polynomials that we can use. So we typically run this with fourth order polynomials and with fourth order time stepping. And of course, by being able to model the geometry very carefully. Yeah? So this makes the solution of this problem relatively efficient. Um, now, um, maybe I'm running a little bit over time. I don't see a time on my computer now, but I mean, this is the end of it. I mean, so I hope I have shown you that we have a method uh, now available that can solve problems uh, in a finite element type framework in the time domain and also on, on realistically speaking uh, large systems um, with relatively little memory consumption um, uh, especially if you have high aspect ratios or uh, multi-length and time scales and i have shown you a few examples i don't repeat all of that um, but uh, rather i would like to thank you for your attention and of course uh, i am open for questions Thanks, Kurt. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, so, so we're running a little bit over, but for some reason you were assigned a shorter time slot than everyone else. So it, it, it's fine. We'll, we'll run a no little worries. bit late for, for Zin's talk. Um, so one question I had, so for the electron energy loss spectroscopy, yeah. you basically have a, a, a current source that's basically a delta function that's moving yeah. through, through your simulation. And so presumably you don't remesh at every time step, uh, yeah. but you have a, a singularity that's moving through your simulation. Yeah. So, can you talk about how uh, how that uh, appears in in, uh, in DG and like what order yeah. of accuracy do you get for for like yeah, kind of moving? That, that, that's function? a very good question. Thank you uh, for that. I mean, actually, that's that's the reason why we use this little tube here um, because what we can do is inside the tube in the center of the tube we are running the electron analytically um, because this is a, a, a point charge that moves with a constant velocity right um, which is a standard problem in electrodynamics um, and then uh, of course and it is on on the trajectory of the electron you're absolutely right the field is singular there i mean so it diverges simply um, and that means um, but we can propagate it because we have the analytic solution to the surface of this tube uh, and then use this to in this surface of the tube from there to inject onto the dgtd uh, calculations or in the, into the numerics um, and uh, because we have a no recoil approximation, we don't need to consider the back action on the electron directly. We just need to calculate the induced field that comes back and, and just uh, record it on the trajectory, uh, like I have shown you here in, in, in this formula, where you uh, this is basically the, the induced field that comes back from this excitation um, that we have launched from the surface of the tube. Yeah. Um, and uh, um, so that's why we don't need the remeshing. I mean, what we actually could do to make the thing more efficient, because we, I mean, in, in DGTD, we have the same problem as MEEP, that we have a explicit method in the sense that we use a, a low storage or Makuta to advance our fields in our particular case, but we could use other um, uh, time steppers. But they would be, as explicit time steppers, they have CFL criterion. Uh, and of course, then our, we are limited by this sort of the size of the smallest element, if you like. So what we could do, and sometimes we actually do this even, we then sort of remesh in the sense once the electron has passed through and we still have to compute, I mean, you have seen this in the movie, um, the field this, uh, propagation, then we basically just take out the tube completely and then we get a, lo a lot of larger elements normally uh, that we can run then the calculations faster. But the singularity is handled by the fact that we are propagating it on the finite distance from the, from the electron trajectory where the field is non-singular anymore. Um, but we have to sort of make that tube, uh, well, roughly a diameter of one nanometer or so, or two nanometers, um, which then leads to a constraint in our time step um, uh, via CFL criterion, as, as usual. Um, yeah. Thank you. Oh, there, I hope that uh, sort of answers the question. What, what kind? Yeah. Are there other questions uh, from the room? Yes. Hi, Kurt. Thanks for your talk. It was fantastic. Uh, quick question for you regarding the code implementation that you and your group right. use. Can you guys talk a little bit about how you, you guys implement this? Do you guys use any commercial tools? Do you guys write everything 
hundred percent from scratch? What, what does that kind of pipeline look like internally? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's interesting. I mean, so, so we, we have started with this, uh, oh, thank you. A very good question, by the way. Um, uh, so we have started with this in, back in 2008 um, uh, with my PhD student, Jens Niegemann, who is actually now the CTO of Lumerico um, <laughs> uh, that has been mentioned before, uh, interestingly. And that's probably also why Lumerical also has a, a basic DGTD code in the store right now. Um, I think that's the only commercial vendor so far. Uh, so what we do is, so we, we, we did actually did everything from scratch. Um, so what we what we really do is, um, we uh, when when you go back to the equations here, I mean we have first of all we have everything in the usual stuff in uh, C plus um, plus. Uh, we have uh, our Git repository and so on and so forth. So that is version control and etc. All of this, but other other than that, we only use uh, um, open software um, and packages, um, the usual things that are available in GNU libraries and so on. Um, and uh, we have implemented, um, uh, mathematically speaking, the system matrix here with all this stuff is actually not necessary to do that because what you can actually do, interestingly enough, if at least as long as you don't have curvilinear finite elements, you can always, via an affine transformation, uh, you can map any element to a reference element and just store away um, the results of the reference element and the Jacobian of the mapping that does this affine mapping. Um, and, and so that becomes very memory efficient if you then not use the matrix per se, but if you, you implement this as an operator that acts on all the unknowns. And that's what we have done ourselves. And uh, um, uh, then we actually get uh, sort of like uh, um, uh, basically little blocks um, where we have this, which basically represent the operator on the individual element um, that we have here. Um, and if we actually then use blast routines and so on to, to just do those calculations um, on this, uh, let's say, 100 by 100 or so little block matrices um, that we get. Uh, but the, the whole thing, the whole system matrix is implemented actually as an operator here. And it turns out, in fact, I mean, at some point we went so far to say that um, the um, uh, blast routines are basically um, uh, uh, not they are done for larger matrices they are optimized for larger matrices so actually we then took even the assembler code that comes out of this and try to optimize the assembler code for cash flow uh, so to squeeze out another you know like factor of two maybe or 80 percent um uh, things and then, and so that's why everything in, in our case is is written by ourselves uh, except uh, except for some uh, uh blast routines and things like this um and uh, it is uh, unfortunately not anywhere near the stage of usability that me pass, for example. So that would be the next step and that we are now starting to develop a little bit more user-friendly interfaces so that maybe eventually, you know, if anybody wants to help us uh, be my guest, uh, we will, might have also a sort of open source version of this, um, but it, it, we are not yet there. I mean. Yeah, so but I, I, but maybe what I could add is that the presently the code has about 300,000 lines um, of C++, yeah, roughly. So it's about three MEEPs in size. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, because we have a lot of material models in there, we have uh, several different time steppers that we can use, of course, we have then um, uh, also these different basis elements for different orders. So, so it, 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 ma it makes things a little bit yeah. more complicated. Um, yeah, no, the, the, the discretization is definitely much more sophisticated than MEEP. So you yeah. pay yeah. price and code complexity. Uh, are there other questions? Yes. Um, does this technique uh, offer any advantages in terms of convergence time for a resident structure over uh, FTTD like me? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it, it it sort of does. Let me go. Maybe um, uh, it, it it of course always depends what you want to do. I mean, uh, the the main message is if you have very high aspect ratios and if you want high accuracy, then usually we are faster or more memory efficient than me. Um, that's what I can say. I mean, uh, we have a, I have here an example um, which is of course um, just. An example. I mean, so this is not a general characteristics. You should be very careful about this. So um, uh, several years back, when in the early days of what we did here, you can see here, 
um, uh, when it was published, and this is the reference to it, um, we considered a 2D calculation, for example, now here, um, and I'll tell you why it's 2D in a second. Uh, here, there is a ring resonator, and you see the scale here. This is microns, so this is an 8 micron uh, uh, ring resonator. This is 200 nanometer thick that is excited by a waveguide, and then there is a 50 nanometer gap. So this is, of course, as bad as it can get, I guess, for a, a regular grid method for that means like for for me potentially too so this is the the, the resolution here uh, and then we have calculated the um, resonance frequencies and also of course the group delay for example that you get for such uh, systems uh, we have done this in various ways we have actually used me we have um, used our method uh, with very high order polynomial, fourth order polynomial, I think, and, and we end even up to sixth order polynomial. And we have done sort of a semi-analytic calculation because this you can, of course, also maybe even you want to do it with a coupled mode theory um, where uh, you just calculate coupling constant and so on. And then, then you can do the calculation. And you see here the outcome is here. Uh, basically, that the semi-analytic reference uh, is with the DG very finely resolved. Then you have me calculations, and then you have the semi-analytic where you use the, uh, I'm sorry, semi-analytic means here that these are coupling constants and so on calculated via DG or via me. So you get the resonance frequencies, of course, right, but the coupling constants you don't get right, at least uh, for the grid size that we used here. And um, uh, you can see when you compare the semi-analytic results with the full DG calculation, you get the same results, essentially. Uh, the difference in the calculation is that we needed in our code a factor of a hundred less memory and that's why we couldn't go to 3d because on our workstations um, with uh, i don't know how much memory we had at the time um, uh, we could not run me simply um, and make a 3d comparison speed wise we are about a factor of 10 for that particular calculation better uh, once again, this is a very case that is tailored to bring out the finite element advantage in this system, of course. I mean, there are other systems where we are not doing so well. Yeah? So the, you cannot make a general case out of this. Uh, but of course, I mean, this is um, uh, a case that is very well suited for our method. Um, and uh, then we also have an advantage. If you want high accuracy, if you're just interested in 5% accuracy or so, of course, then probably it's uh, MEEP would be more efficient um, in this case. So so it, it's it's always a question, what do you want? Um, and and, and there, as, as Stephen said, there is not the method of solving Maxwell equations. I mean, it's just, um, you know, I mean, you, you have, uh, we, I had a PhD student, um, uh, who once uh, showed uh, uh, a slide, which is a little bit shocking, but nonetheless, I mean, he, he had it as uh, he the title was "Importance of the Right Tool," and then he showed the toothbrush and the toilet brush on it. Um, so it's really the question: What do you want to do? You have to have the right tool for the right problem, right? I mean, and so our code is really nice, or our method is really nice for. Um, for high aspect ratios systems like this one here um, uh, and for high accuracies. Um, uh, it is nothing that you will implement in half a day or something like this on the other hand and uh, uh, it has not any particular advantage if you are interested in, in linear problems with uh, not so high accuracy and with you know not so uh, strange aspect ratios then you don't when we can of course also calculate that but it has no specific advantages than there.